They were everywhere in the 60s, from department stores to bookshops and even high-end galleries. No one could escape the gaze of big, teary-eyed children staring at them from every direction. But where did these paintings come from? Why were they so popular? And who was the mastermind behind the big eyes? Well, as it turns out, the answer to that last question will become the basis for an eight-year-long court battle between Margaret Keane and her ex-husband Walter, who, for over a decade, took credit for his wife's work. The legal battle between Margaret and Walter has actually become so famous that in 2014, director Tim Burton, apparently a fan of Margaret's paintings, decided to make a film about her life and career. But how accurate is the film? Let's take a look and find out. Though the film definitely feels like a Tim Burton production, it still provides a fairly accurate portrayal of Margaret and Walter's lives, including such details as Margaret leaving her husband, Frank Ulbrich, before moving with her daughter to North Beach, a neighborhood in San Francisco known for its bustling art community. Her encounter with real estate agent slash supposed amateur artist Walter Keane while selling portraits at a local art show. The fact that Margaret's reason for painting large eyes revolved around an experience she had in her early childhood when a bout of temporary hearing loss forced her to start paying closer attention to people's eyes. Walter and Margaret's brief romance and abrupt marriage. Though unlike in the film, the circumstances surrounding exactly why the pair got married is a bit unclear. While Walter claimed that it was a marriage of convenience for the purpose of gaining custody of their daughters, Susan and Jane, not unlike in the film, Margaret didn't talk much about exactly why she married Walter, simply stating that she initially found his charisma and confidence very attractive. Ah, sorry for the long explanation. Walter, attempting to gain some publicity by having their paintings displayed at a popular nightclub called The Hungry Eye, before getting into an argument with the club's owner, Enrico Vanducci, and getting arrested. The resulting bad press stimulating public interest in Margaret's paintings and inspiring Walter to claim credit for his wife's work. Margaret going against her better judgments and allowing Walter to claim credit for her paintings. The opening of the Keene Gallery in North Beach and Walter's ingenious idea to start selling prints and posters of Margaret's work after a series of poster robberies demonstrated the mass market appeal of her paintings. Walter's artist backstory, which claims that while traveling in Europe after the war, he was exposed to masses of frightened, neglected, and abused children who became the inspiration for his paintings. Margaret attempting to establish her own style by painting a series of long-limbed women, which she initialed MDH in reference to her maiden name as well as her interest in numerology. Walter's daughter from his first marriage, not Susan. Wonder why they decided to change her name. The couple's move to Woodside, California and Margaret's discovery that Walter couldn't paint. Though according to Margaret, she actually discovered this fact while they were still living in North Beach. Walter's masterpiece, Tomorrow Forever, being chosen as the theme painting for the Hall of Education at the 1964 World's Fair. Until John Kennedy, an art critic from the New York Times, wrote an article denouncing the painting as tasteless hackwork the couple's divorce, and Margaret's relocation to Hawaii, where she and her daughter were eventually baptized as Jehovah's Witnesses. Margaret's public confession and the ensuing court case against Walter and Gannett, USA Today's parent company, in response to an article which levied defamatory statements against Margaret. The dismissal of Margaret's libel case against Gannett leaving Walter without legal counsel and forcing him to represent himself. 
And finally, the court-sanctioned paint-off and Margaret's ultimate victory over Walter, who claimed he was unable to paint due to a shoulder injury. If you pay close attention, you can find a number of Easter eggs scattered throughout the film, including while showing her around North Beach, Margaret's friend references a real restaurant called Nessie's, which is located at 498 Broadway, directly across from the Keen Gallery, the scene where actor Christoph Waltz encourages some potential buyers to touch his paintings was probably intended to be a subtle jab at Walter Keane's very off-the-wall autobiography, The World of Keane, where he scolds an overly eager Margaret for attempting to touch one of his paintings. Speaking of Margaret, the real Margaret Keane can be spotted briefly sitting on a park bench behind actress Amy Adams. John Kennedy is seen reading a real issue of Life magazine that was published in August of 1965. Interestingly enough, this issue actually features a quote from Kennedy about Tomorrow Forever, where he admits to never actually seeing the painting in person, claiming that he instead based his review on a photograph. Like many films based on true stories, Big Eyes plays a bit fast and loose with dates and chronology. While I couldn't find the exact date that Margaret separated from her first husband, Frank Ulbrich, we do know that the pair parted ways well before 1958, the date given in the film, as marriage records show that Frank married his second wife in 1955. The opening of the Keene Gallery also took place two years prior to the date given in the film, in 1958. I also think it's worth mentioning that while the film implies that Margaret's new faith was the catalyst that inspired her to finally admit the truth about Walter, as we'll see later, Margaret actually admitted the truth in October of 1970, two years before she was baptized as a Jehovah's Witness. Walter's confrontation at the Hungry Eye played out a bit differently than it does in the film. While the reason for the fight varies between different accounts, it's generally accepted that Vanducci, the club's owner, attempted to hit Walter but accidentally struck a female patron, though for some reason Walter was the one who got arrested. And though he was eventually acquitted, this incident, as well as the preceding trial, generated considerable publicity for Margaret's paintings, inspiring Walter to create his own gallery, which opened less than a month after his arrest. Say what you will about Walter Keane, but the man definitely knew a good business opportunity when he saw one. While it's true that John Kennedy's very damning review of Tomorrow Forever resulted in the painting's removal from the New York World's Fair, I could find no evidence that Walter ever confronted Kennedy about the article in person, or tried to stab him with a fork. I think the scene only exists because Burton thought the film needed an accent sequence, or he just wanted to make Terrence Stamp look like a total badass. The film neglects to mention that both Walter and Margaret remarried after their divorce. Walter married his third wife, Joan Mary Mervyn, in 1969, while Margaret married Dan McGuire in 1966, just one year after her separation from Walter. I'm going to hazard a guess and say that Margaret was one of those people who really didn't like being single though it does seem like three was her lucky number, as she and Dan remained happily married for 17 years, until his death in 1983. In 1970, during an interview for UPI, Margaret admitted for the first time that she, not Walter, was responsible for the wave paintings. In the same interview, Margaret also challenged her ex-husband to a paint-off at Union Square in San Francisco, which he failed to attend, alleging years later that he was unaware of Margaret's challenge. During, or possibly directly after, this incident, 
Walter, along with his third wife, Joan, decide to relocate overseas, supposedly for the purpose of gathering artwork for an international gallery, a monumental project which, despite Walter's costly contribution of $250,000, never actually got off the ground. In addition to his sizable financial loss, Walter's marriage also began to suffer as he and his wife ended up separating sometime in the late 70s. Alone and with his finances dwindling, Walter's rock star lifestyle of expensive food, travel, and frivolity underwent a serious downgrade. Now confined to North Beach, Walter spent the majority of his time drinking at his favorite haunts, the Wailing Bar, until an alcohol-induced accident forced him to give up drinking entirely. Now sober, Keen, in an attempt to regain his squandered wealth, filed a copyright infringement suit against Margaret in April of 1982. Though the case was dismissed with prejudice two years later in 1984, this incident marked the beginning of an eight-year-long legal battle that would determine the true creator of the wave paintings. Well, at least as far as the US court system was concerned. In addition to his copyright suit, Walter, who claimed that he could no longer paint, began writing an autobiography, reasoning that his rise to fame and scandalous rock star lifestyle would make the book an instant bestseller. However, while drumming up publicity for his book, Walter leveled some derogatory accusations against his ex-wife claiming in an interview for USA Today that, in addition to taking credit for his paintings, she had also started spreading rumors that he was dead. A pretty far cry from the slanderous comments Walter made in the film, where he claimed that he taught Margaret how to paint using a slide projector, though Walter did make a similar comment about Margaret in his autobiography. So it's technically still accurate? Anyway, in retaliation, Margaret decided to sue both Walter and USA Today on the grounds that their statements had done harm to her public reputation. Unfortunately, or I guess fortunately for Margaret, before the trial even began, Walter's defense started to fall apart as his lawyer, Seymour Ellison, was forced to abandon the case due to personal reasons. Though Walter, Unlike his film counterpart, did ask that the trial be postponed, his request was denied on the grounds that his legal counsel had withdrawn well over a month before the trial date, giving him ample time to find a new lawyer. Instead, the judge decided to bifurcate the trial so that the two cases could be tried separately, giving Walter the opportunity to seek counsel from his co-defendant Gannett, USA Day's parent company. However, this plan soon fell apart when Margaret's case against Gannett was dismissed on the grounds that Margaret's lawyers hadn't produced any evidence of actual malice by USA Today. Now alone at the defense table, Walter had no choice but to represent himself, which by all accounts was an absolute train wreck. While Walter's defense obviously suffered from his lack of legal training, his case all but fell apart when one of his key witnesses, a longtime friend named John May, admitted that he'd never actually seen Walter paint. On the other hand, the opposition was able to produce ample evidence that Margaret was the originator of the Big Eye paintings, with the most damning example being Exhibit 224, which Margaret completed in front of the jury in just 53 minutes. In the end, Margaret won her case and was awarded $4 million in damages, which she never received as Walter filed for bankruptcy in 1987. Though Walter Keane died well before Big Eyes was released in 2014, the film's less than positive portrayal of him has solicited some criticism primarily from Keane's family, who insists that, despite his faults, Walter was a compassionate and loving person. In fact, during an interview for Uprox, Susan Keane, Walter's daughter from his first marriage, actually corroborated her father's story, claiming that he created the big eye art style. 
which Margaret learned to copy while studying as his assistant. While I can't comment on the nature of Baldur's character, having never met him in person, when it comes to the question of exactly who created the wave paintings, I find that the court's decision leaves little room for argument. Though Baldur's defense undoubtedly suffered from a lack of proper legal representation, this doesn't change the fact that despite a supposedly long and illustrious career as an artist, he was unable to produce a single witness that could actually attest to having seen him paint. Walter's actions also seem suspect, considering it took him 12 years to take legal action against Margaret, despite the fact that her claims most likely had a negative effect on his business and public reputation. If Walter actually had a case against Margaret, wouldn't it have made more sense for him to have taken legal action before his money and influence dried up, preferably when he could still paint? And while I do acknowledge that Walter Keane was probably far more nuanced than the two-dimensional villain portrayed in the film, this fact does nothing to prove his claims or excuse his actions, though Margaret's passing in 2022 probably put an end to any controversy surrounding the wave paintings. Not that there is that much to begin with. Well, as always, I'm Silver Jade, asking you to please remember to support your local library, and I hope to see you again next time.